This program is rated PG. It contains themes and scenes which may not be suitable for very young audiences. Parental guidance is advised. Working to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. Hello, you're watching ASEAN in Focus. We're coming to you live from Manila. I'm Alma Angeles. Joining me is Ms. Shirley Navaja from Vietnam. Hello, Shirley. Hello, Adma, and good afternoon to you and to everyone. I am Shirley Navaja from your EBC Vietnam Bureau, bringing you the latest news in the dynamic ASEAN region. On today's headlines. That's it. No. Foreign yes. Affairs Secretary Teodoro Loxin continued mm. to question the reason behind the pulling out of the Philippine ship in Scarborough Shoal during a standoff with China back in 2012. The governor of Phuket says the planned reopening of the province to fully vaccinated international tourists from July 1 may not materialize if the number of daily infections continues at the current rate. Uh, product. President Duterte has placed the entire Philippines under a state of calamity for a period of one year due to the African swine fever outbreak. And we have an exclusive interview in our program later in Bali, Talakayan. And Malaysian state fund 1MDB is suing units of Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan and Coots according to court documents, the latest effort to recover massive losses from the scandal hit investment vehicle. First in the country, a magnitude 5.8 earthquake jolted Occidental Mindoro and nearby areas on Wednesday, according to the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology. The tectonic quake struck 11 kilometers northeast of the municipality of Abra de Ilog. At 9 this morning, it had a depth of 110 kilometers. The following intensities have been recorded in these areas. Intensity 5, Calatagan, Batangas. Intensity 4, Puerto Galera, Oriental, Mindoro. Intensity 3, Carmona, Tagaytay City, Cavite, Muntinlupa, Metro Manila, San Jose, Occidental Mindoro, Calapan City, and Oriental Mindoro. Intensity 2 in Calumpit, Marilao, Plaridel, Bulacan, Las Piñas, Malabon, Marikina, Pasig, Quezon City, Metro Manila, Dolores, Gumaca, Mulanay, Quezon Province, Olongapo City, Zambales. And Intensity 1 in San Jose City, Nueva Ecija, Guagua, Pampanga, Infanta, Lopez, Polillo, Quezon Province. Aftershocks, FIVO said, are possible, but the agency also said it's not expecting damage from the tremor. FIVOX on Monday evening, May 11th, raised the status of Mount Bulusan to alert level one as the active volcano in Sorsogon manifested a low level unrest. Some 124 volcanic quakes were recorded since May 8. These quakes are caused by movements or eruptions from magma from the volcano. Phreatic eruptions at the summit crater or flank vents from the upper to middle slopes were also observed. Such parameters indicate that volcanic processes are underway beneath the edifice, Fivok said. Fivox reiterated that entry into the 4-kilometer radius permanent danger zone, or PDZ, must be strictly prohibited. Vigilance in the 2-kilometer extended danger zone on the southeast sector must be exercised due to increased possibilities of sudden phreatic eruptions. It added that people living within valleys and along rivers must be vigilant against stream flows and lahar in the event of heavy rainfall.
And staying in the country, Foreign Affairs Secretary Teodoro Loxin Jr. continued to question the reason behind the pulling out of the Philippine ship in Scarborough Shoal. This during a standoff with China back in 2012. Let's listen in. That's it. Now, the question really is, who lost possession of the, that reef, Scarborough? I was a little hard on the, I have been very hard on the Americans blaming them because when there was a confrontation between a Philippine ship, uh, Del, please correct me huh, uh, at any point, and a Chinese ship, and now it's become 30 ships, according to the Rosario, so I'm not sure how many ships there are, no? But when they confronted themselves, the interference, the participation of the United States was to try to stop people from attacking each other. Well, it's, it's, they think it's their job. So they said, stand down. So they stood down. And then the United States told both sides, not taking sides, said, withdraw. Now, if you believe, your government at that time believes that that is yours, why will you withdraw? These are only good officers of the United States. It is a suggestion. I think you should both withdraw. So what you should have done, I don't want to say that like I know better after the fact, but the truth is if I, if I have un clause on my side saying it's, we are within the exclusive economic zone and the Chinese ship is not, from my point of view, then I'll say, I'll just look at the other side and say, go. And you go, I'll go. But you the go. question is this. When they said in good offices, as the president used, I, I didn't even know the term, uh, the good offices to mediate, stand down, withdraw. When we withdrew, the United States has no obligation, Mr. President, to go to war. The thing about the Mutual Defense Treaty is you have to be attacked. Nobody was attacked. We withdrew. If the Chinese wanted to attack, mm. there was nobody to attack. <laughs> the, the other side left, and I don't know if they would have attacked. That's one thing. I have talked to the Chinese, uh, to, to Foreign Minister Wang Yi. They have no intention to do that. If you had kept up that face-off, it might have ended up in just the two sides talking to each other. But why we withdrew when we had own clause in place that said, under this law, we have the right to be here, you don't, but we did. And that's the meaning of losing possession. Then you walk away from that. And there is no obligation, even at that time, I would say, um, President Aquino, why don't you go into the water? It goes all the way there. Because you cannot expect the United States to trigger the Mutual Defense Treaty unless they sink the boat in which you are. But if you are not want to go there, in fact, I was willing to be a ship's cook. I can do it, you know. If you're not willing to go there, there's no obligation to, to, to defend the Philippines because it hasn't been attacked. There's no obligation to defend if you are not attacked. Back in April 2012, the Philippine government sent the BRP Gregorio del Pilar to Scarborough Shoal after a surveillance aircraft spotted eight Chinese vessels anchored inside the lagoon. And upon inspection, it discovered a large amount of illegally collected corals, giant clams, and live sharks in the compartments of the said ships. Now, at that time, two Chinese maritime surveillance ships managed to position themselves between the Philippine warship and the Chinese fishing vessels, preventing the Navy from arresting the poachers. The start of a tense standoff over the shoal, which is well within the Philippine exclusive economic zone, and eventually the Philippine ship withdrew. Recalling the incident, the former Foreign Affairs Secretary Albert Del Rosario last week explained that the United States brokered a deal for both nations to simultaneously pull out the ships, but Chinese President Xi Jinping breached the deal. Now, Loxin, on the other hand, said Washington's participation was merely to try to stop people from attacking each other because it cannot force the Philippines nor China to withdraw in the first place.
And the Philippine National Police or PNP has apprehended 566,000 and 177 individuals from March 1 to May 7 for violating minimum public health standards amid the coronavirus disease outbreak. Based on the latest data released by the PNP on Wednesday, 219,778 were apprehended for not wearing face shields. 185 thousand and ten of them were given a warning 28,559 were fined and 6,209 were charged meanwhile 226,904 were accosted for not wearing face masks 127,060 of them were warned 80, 81,354 were fined and 18,490 charged a total of 3,496 individuals were flagged for mass gathering. 2,496 of them were reprimanded and 720 were fined and 280 were charged. In the same period, the police also accosted 115,999 for violating physical distancing protocols. 92,177 of them were warned for such behavior 18,408 were fined and 5,414 were charged. Fines range from 100 pesos to 5,000 pesos, depending on the ordinance of local government units. The PNP Chief General Guillermo Elazar has ordered police officers to provide free face masks to persons who could not afford to buy one. He added that violators of the face masks ordinance would not be jailed but would be booked and investigated violators will also undergo undergo a records check to determine whether they are repeat offenders and the news continues here on ASEAN in focus charlene and i will be back right after this break This portion is brought to you by Security Bank. Turuan din natin ang mga bata ng tamang paghugas ng mga kamay. Basain ang kamay ng tubig at lagyan ng sabon. Kuskusin ang iyong mga palad. Gayon din ang pagitan ng mga daliri. Pati na ang likod ng mga palad at talire. Ganun din ang iyong hinalaki. Kasama ang mga dulo ng iyong mga dalire. Pagkatapos ay iyong palapulsuhan. Gawin ito ng kahit dalawampung segundo. Pagkatapos ay banlawan ng tubig at patuyuin. Welcome back to CNN Focus. A board of director of FYL Pro or Filipino Young Leaders Program based in the United States are now lobbying and asking the Biden administration to fast track the order of 20 million vaccines paid for by the Philippine government be delivered as soon as possible as the Philippines continue to suffer on high incidence of the pandemic. Don Orozco, our Silicon Valley senior correspondent, in his program Radio Aguila Sa America Talks to Hawaii TV News anchor or reporter Annalisa Borgos. Hi, Don. Hello. Uh-huh. Annalisa, so uh, we have this order of about 20 million vaccines from Moderna. And we just wanted to know, you know, it's uh, we feel that this is something that the Filipino people actually need immediately. Can you share something? That's right. That? That's right. You know, with how bad it is with cases there, it's so important to get this order expedited. So 
I am part of an organization called the Filipino Young Leaders Program, or PhilPro, and we are in front of a campaign called hashtag Moderna Vax 2PH. And we are calling on the U.S. government, uh, the Biden administration, to expedite the delivery of at least some of that 20 million, maybe 3 million, to at least get many Filipinos vaccinated. Because as you know, the case counts are rising, the, there's variants that are making things much more contagious. So we are lobbying, we're asking everyone out there to write to the US government, to their uh, government leaders, to get this moved up from July to May and then release at least 3 million of those Moderna vaccines because they're already paid for by the Philippine government. There's just this sticking point that there's a defense act that says, you know, the U.S. needs to control its own outbreak before these vaccines are released. But as we know, cases are dropping here in the United States and also mm -hmm. vaccines are readily available. So it's time to share. Yes. Uh, you know, Annalisa, one of the things that the incidence of uh, COVID-19 here has really dropped is because of uh, the proliferation of so many vaccines available. We have that Pfizer, we have Moderna, and now they recently reissued the Johnson & Johnson. And which brings me to a question of uh, how is Hawaii? Annalisa is actually uh, based in Hawaii. So how is Hawaii in terms of tourism? We're doing pretty good, Don, because we have been very conservative in requiring anyone entering to have a negative COVID-19 test. We're the only state that really requires it because as you know, we're an island. So if this disease comes here, we only have very limited hospital resources and it would be devastating to our economy and to our people. So right now, the numbers are low, they're maintained with the exception of Kauai. So Kauai is the neighbor island outside of Oahu and its, its numbers are higher. But here generally in the state, it's doing pretty well. And pretty soon we're going to have a vaccine passport. So on May 11th, anyone traveling inter-island here in the state and was vaccinated in the state can go to other islands, travel inter-island and not have to get a negative COVID-19 test. Uh, they can just travel freely because they are fully vaccinated. So we have that information on our my company's website, KITV.com, if you want more details. Pretty soon they'll open that up to trans-Pacific domestic travelers. So if you're traveling between mainland United States to Hawaii, you don't have to take a negative, get a negative COVID-19 test if you have uh, proof that you are fully vaccinated. So that'll help a lot of people who want to travel, you know, back and forth because they want to see family in Hawaii. Not sure yet okay. about international. It's still going to take a while, I think, international travelers. Mm -hmm. They still have to quarantine. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, That's uh, Miss Annalisa Burgos. She is one of the uh, community leaders in the state of Hawaii here in the United States. Reporting live here in Silicon Valley, California, this is Don Orozco for Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Now back here in the country, according to Dr. Isagani Padolina of Pharma Services Group in Tilburg, Netherlands, they found no adverse effects caused by the vaccine against COVID-19 from the Gamalaya Institute Sputnik V and the Janssen Pharmaceuticals. The doctor also talked about uh, some side effects seen from the vaccine. Let's listen in. Yung common adverse events na nagagaling sa, sa mga phase 3 clinical trials, Wala, walang unusual, walang, walang tinatawag natin na more than uh, level 3 or stage 3. Uh, halos lahat siya ay stage 1, stage 2. So yung mga uh, pain dun sa intramuscular injection site, um, uh, counting fever na, na gagamot pag kumuha ka ng paracetamol or ibuprofen, uh, counting nausea, sakit ng ulo, um, siguro nagkakasakit sila ng kaka-fever sila ng mga dalawang araw, yun ay mga malala. 
Uh, pero walang 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 na observe na adverse events na causative to the vaccine. At saka so far, dun sa general in general, dun sa vaccines, meron na tayo mga more than 300 million vaccinated uh, uh, people sa uh, uh, globally. So mga mga nasa more than 1 billion doses yon uh, na nabigay na. Um Wala naman tayo nakikitang, nakikitang malalaking, malalaking events na, na nag-a-outweigh nung benefits versus risk ng vaccine. Residents of Bangkok slum Klong Toy one of the most crowded areas in the Thai capital received Sinovac and AstraZeneca vaccines at an indoor football stadium. Authorities are battling a COVID-19 outbreak with Bangkok being the epicenter of the country's third wave. So far, 1.3 million people have been given a single dose of either vaccines in the kingdom. With over 1,000 newly confirmed cases daily for nearly a month, Authorities have vowed to procure more vaccines and accelerate the inoculation campaign. Some 450 people have died from COVID-19 in Thailand. Staying in Thailand, the governor of Phuket said the planned reopening of the province to fully vaccinated international tourists from July 1 may not happen if the number of daily infections continues at the current rate. According to the Bangkok Post, the governor said that they've set a target for the number of daily infections to go down to one digit by May 15 so that they can reopen the island to international tourists by July 1. Cusack Kukyatekul, chief of the provincial health office, said that the COVID-19 situation in Phuket was still worrying and that the number of daily infections continued to rise among high-risk people in local quarantine. Active case finding was detecting new clusters because there were still social gatherings in violation of provincial COVID controls. Now, Thailand has imposed massive restrictions visitor arrivals in order to stem the coronavirus. But discouraging tourism has led to its economy recording the worst performance since the 1997 Asian financial crisis. The impact has also reverberated across the country's services sectors, bruising entertainment, retail, hotels and restaurants. Now to recall, Thailand's tourism czar announced that Phuket, renowned for its sandy beaches and sapphire waters, will be used as a test. Tourists who have been vaccinated will be allowed to travel there without mandatory hotel quarantine. Yutasak Supasorn, governor of the Tourism Authority of Thailand, said that time that the Phuket sandbox, sandbox model would begin sometime from July onwards. And foreign visitors will be required to have had two doses of COVID vaccine, a certificate set signifying negative test results, and to download a mobile tracking application. Malaysian State of Fund 1MDB is suing units of Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan and Coots, according to court documents. The latest effort to recover massive losses from the scandal hit investment vehicle. Billions of dollars were looted from one Malaysia development Berhad in a globe spanning fraud that involved former Prime Minister Najib Razak and spent on everything from real estate to artwork. The scandal played a large part in Najib's long ruling coalition losing power in 2018. One MDB is suing Deutsche Bank in Malaysia for $1.11 billion, JP Morgan in Switzerland for $800 million, and a Swiss based unit of Coots for $1.03 billion, according to documents filed at Kuala Lumpur High Court on Friday. The fund is also seeking interest payments from all the banks. The claims are based on negligence, breach of contract, conspiracy to defraud or injure 
and or dishonest assistance according to the documents which were seen by AFP. Deutsche Bank said in a statement, we have not been served any papers and we are not aware of any basis for legitimate claim against Deutsche Bank. JP Morgan and Coots did not respond to requests to comment. In other news now, Myanmar's military seized power on February 1, ousting the civilian government and arresting its leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, in its 100 days of turmoil there. The 100 days that have followed have seen mass street protests, bloody crackdowns by the junta, economic turmoil, and growing international concern. The general staged a coup on February 1, detaining Nobel Peace Laureate Suu Kyi and her top allies in pre-dawn raids. The generals claimed fraud in November's election, which Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy Party won by a landslide. Now, the uh, bloody intensity of the crackdowns has ebbed in recent weeks, partly as demonstrators have switched to flash mob tactics to avoid the risk of being shot. But if the violence in Myanmar's urban centers has slowed clashes between the military and ethnic rebel armies in its border regions have intensified. In Eastern Karen State, the Karen National Union, who are sheltering dissidents fleeing to their territory, has captured military posts and had been hit with multiple airstrikes in return. A group of ousted lawmakers who set themselves up as a shadow national unity government or the NUG announced the creation of a People's Defense Force to protect the civilians from the military. But the junta on Saturday designated it as a terrorist group, blaming it for bombing, arson, manslaughter and intimidation to disrupt the state administrative machinery. So far, neither calls for restraint nor U.S., European Union and British sanctions have shown signs of deflecting the generals off their chosen course. On April 2, Suu Kyi's lawyer announced the most serious charge laid against her of breaching the Official Secrets Act. A summit of regional bloc ASEAN last month, attended by junta leader Min Aung Lang, yielded no more than a five-point consensus, calling for dialogue, an end to violence, and the appointment of a special envoy. But even this limited achievement was undermined days later when the junta said it would heed suggestions only when the situation returns to stability. Thailand said Tuesday it was seeking a humanitarian solution for three Myanmar journalists arrested after fleeing across the border to escape a junta crackdown. The trio's employer, the Democratic Voice of Burma, or DVB, and the Thai Foreign Correspondents Club urge the authorities not to deport them, warning their lives could be in danger if they returned to the coup-hit country. Myanmar has been in turmoil since the military ousted civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi on February 1st, triggering a mass uprising as large swaths of population take to the streets to demand democracy. The junta has responded with force shooting protesters, arresting suspected dissidents in night raids, and targeting journalists and news outlets by shutting them down. Thai authorities on Tuesday confirmed the arrest, while Foreign Ministry spoke spokesman Tani Sangrat said they were seeking a way out of the case. Tani told reporters that Thai authorities concerned are coordinating to find possible humanitarian solution to this case. DVB said the group was arrested during a random search in the northern city of Chiang Mai and would appear in court on Tuesday to face charges of illegally entering Thailand. The Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand warned Tuesday that if the journalists were deported, they would face a certain arrest and persecution, if not worse. A prominent Thai democracy protest leader facing royal defamation charges was granted bail on Tuesday amid deteriorating health following a hunger strike that lasted more than 50 days. Take a look. Treat us as an animal. 
not really human being. And one of the most silly things, uh, they stop all kind of information. They not allow you to read the book because of Tenpin want to study the books and he's an intellectual and student, want to read but prohibited to read the books. Barry Chirawak, who goes by the nickname Penguin, had been remanded in custody since March when authorities indicted him under Thailand's strict Le Mahesta laws. In late, late April, he was transferred to hospital after losing 12 kilograms. The university student faces 20 Le Mahesta charges for his role in last year's demonstrations against the Thai government, which called for reforms to the country's monarchy. On Tuesday, a criminal court granted Parit bail. Late on Tuesday night, he left the Klong Klem Maximum Security Prison in an ambulance accompanied by his mother and wearing a t-shirt emblazoned with monarchy reform. Before his release, he was hit with a further arrest warrant for a separate criminal charge but was granted bail. Musician Chai Morn Kaiwi Bupan was also granted bail over two royal defamation charges he faces. And an elderly French Vietnamese woman has reacted after failing in her bid to sue Monsanto and other makers of the toxic chemical agent Orange over its use by the U.S. as a weapon during the Vietnam War. C'est vrai que quand j'ai reçu euh, le message, euh, euh, le message qu'on m'a envoyé euh, tout là-bas, alors c'est vrai que j'ai eu comme un, un choc dans le cœur parce que je n'y m'attendais pas. À, à, je me suis préparée déjà pour le pire, mais mes telles décisions, mais ça m'a abasourdi. Dans ce jugement, ce qui me choque le plus, c'est que le jury a pris presque exactement les arguments, les termes des avocats de la partie adverse. Moi, j'ai confiance en la justice française. J'ai toujours confiance, mais je suis en colère quand même contre euh, la, la conclusion d'hier. Ne vous inquiétez pas, j'irai jusqu'au bout et je survivrai jusqu'à euh, jusqu la fin. Je crois que euh, notre combat pour, contre euh, les crimes de l'agent Orange et le combat de... Uh, contre l'écocide vont aller ensemble. Okay, bon, Nine-year-old complainant who covered the 1955 to 1975 war as a reporter but has lived in France for the past three decades also accused the companies of environmental damage. But a court in the Paris suburb of Every ruled that the firms have had been acting on the orders of and on behalf of the United States and therefore enjoyed immunity from prosecution under international law, which prevents one country from judging the actions of another. Campaign groups estimate that 4 million people in Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia were exposed to the 76 million liters or 20 million gallons of Agent Orange sprayed by U.S. forces to destroy ground cover and food source in its, in its battle with communist North Vietnamese troops between 1962 and 1971. Vietnam blames it for severe birth defects in 150,000 children, but so far only military veterans from the United States, Australia, and Korea have won compensation for the after effects of the highly toxic chemical. Chan Tunga suffers from type 2 diabetes and an extremely rare insulin allergy, which is linked to exposure to Agent Orange. In other news, COVID jab maker BioNTech said Monday it would build a Southeast Asia headquarters and manufacturing site in Singapore to produce hundreds of millions of mRNA-based vaccines per year. Speaking in a press conference alongside Singapore's Minister of Trade and Industry, CEO Uger Sain said the facility would not help 
increase global vaccine supply over or would help increase the global supply over the next year? Take a look. We have to be clear um, that, that uh, starting now manufacturing, building manufacturing in Singapore will not help us in the next 12 months with regard to the global supply. The global supply can only be addressed by, by really, really increasing the, the existing, existing, existing production capaci capacities. Yeah. Uh, we, we did that and we are continue to do that in the next next um, next uh, 12 months. So your question, yes, it's in the range of hundreds of millions of dollars, US dollars. And uh, and uh, and yes, of course, establishing a manufacturing uh, um, a hub in Singapore also means that a certain percentage will go to Singapore itself. So again, just to clear that up, CEO Uger Sahin said the facility would not help increase global vaccine supply over the next year. Construction of the site will start this year and it could become operational by 2023. The Singapore production site will be the German company's first mRNA manufacturing facility outside Europe and will have an estimated capacity of several hundred doses, several hundred million doses of such vaccines. Its partner Pfizer operates production sites in the U.S. as well as in Belgium. Now, messenger RNA or mRNA genetic technology trains the body to reproduce spike protein similar to that found on the coronavirus. When exposed to the real virus later, the body recognizes the spike proteins and is now able to fight them off. U.S. pharmaceutical firm Moderna uses the same technology for its vaccine. And a CNN Focus will be right back. Innovation, digital disruption, globalization. Startups, micro, small and medium enterprises, as well as large corporations, all face interesting challenges in the market today. Peek into the world of exciting opportunities and partnerships to drive growth with the latest business news and information. We are open for business. Your weekly dose of entrepreneurial inspiration to update you on the latest developments in the world of business. Get up close and personal with CEOs and thought leaders to help you discover valuable insights Sharpen your instincts for smart decision-making with the latest markets and economic trends, disruptive ideas, global innovation, social entrepreneurship, and other leading-edge business ideas. Join the conversations to create a more vibrant environment for entrepreneurship. Catch Open for Business from Vision to Action. Welcome back. The Philippine economy shrank in the first three months of the year as coronavirus restrictions suppressed activity. But a top official said there were signs the country was on the mend. Socioeconomic Plan Secretary Carl Chua told the briefing that the latest economic performance shows the limits of economic recovery without any major relaxation of our quarantine policy. But there were tentative signs of a rebound with Chua pointing to quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth of 0.3% and a pickup in employment. Let's listen in. The priorities in the final year of the administration are as follows. We are working closely with Congress to enact 12 important measures by June of 2021. The Legislative Executive Development Advisory Council or LEDAC Execom has agreed on a common legislative agenda. And of that long list, there are 12 priority measures targeted to be passed by June 2021 or before the adjournment of this session. Our recovery is slated uh, starting this year, and we would achieve pre-pandemic level in 2022, middle of 2022. And all of these are needed to prevent long-term scarring and productivity losses. The Development Budget and Coordination Committee 
has approved a 6.5 to 7.5 percent growth this year and up to 10 percent growth in 2022. Although the recent imposition of ECQ and MECQ may be lower, uh, may lower our growth uh, estimate, but we are still early in the year and there is ample opportunity to catch up. And the enablers of our recovery are along three pillars. The first is the safe reopening of the economy once the spike is over, managing the risk better instead of having everyone put in quarantine when we can target the areas of highest risk. The second one is the timely implementation of our recovery package. And the third one is the timely implementation of our vaccination program. These are the achievements in the first five years of the administration and our program of priority for the remaining year. So far, nearly 2 million people have received their first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, according to official data. Fewer than half a million are fully vaccinated. The recent tightening of restrictions in Manila and surrounding provinces, the country's economic heartland, could dampen growth, Chua warned. But he said we will not backpedal. The economy slumped by a revised 9.6% last year. It's worse since records began in 1946. And President Rodrigo Duterte has placed the entire Philippines under a state of calamity for a period of one year due to the African Swine Fever or ASF outbreak. Duterte in his proclamation 1143 inked on May 10 explained that the declaration of state of calamity will allow the national government and LGUs to utilize appropriate funds including the quick response fund in their response efforts to contain the continuing spread of ASF and restore normalcy in ASF hit areas. Earlier, we had an exclusive interview with our program Balitakayan, had an exclusive interview with Secretary William Dar on the issue. Let's listen in. Opo at uh, mas napag-igting na under proclamation number 1143 yung uh, much closer na partnership between the Department of Agriculture and the local uh, government units so sa probinsya, sa siyudad at sa munisipyo hanggat barangay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, malaking uh, tulong po ito at ang mga LGUs na ay uh, pwede nang uh, maggamit uh, ng kanilang quick response fund para dito rin sa laban against uh, African swine fever. Uh, obligado na under this proclamation 1143 na ang laban dito sa ASF ay laban uh, ang laban ng DA at saka local government units. Surveillance and monitoring na early warning system is now put in place kasi that will help us uh, contain yung uh, SF sa isang lugar. So minabuti po na ma may mas marami po tayong magagamit ngayon na mga tools or mga equipment at uh, mas maganda na itong early warning system against African swine fever. Now, uh, on top of that, mayroong sinasagawa ngayon ng Bureau of Animal Industry with the uh, partners from the private sector. Mayroong tatlong uh, antiviral products na produkto dito sa Pilipinas, yung dalawa. At ang pangatlo po dito ay yung ivermectin. So, uh, we are also trying and testing this uh, para sa ganun. Uh, makita po natin kung may epekto o wala. Now, mayroon tayong uh, vaccination or vaccine trials din against ASF. At nakikita ko po when na uh, ito na yung uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Kagaya po sa COVID-19 mm -hmm. na ang uh, bakuna po ay this will really help uh, the industry in this case.
Indonesia's economy shrank for the fourth consecutive quarter in January. March data showed Wednesday as the country's leaders struggled to overcome a recession wrought by the coronavirus pandemic. Now, the 0.74% on-year contraction was a big improvement on the 2.19% in the previous three months, but slightly worse than expected with the tourism sector among the worst affected industries. However, Statistics Bureau Suharyanto told reporters, quote, it is still negative, but it is much better compared to the previous quarters, which shows that the trend of the economic recovery is on track. On a quarterly basis, Southeast Asia's biggest economy contracted 0.96%. And last year, the economy shrank 2.07% as it entered its first recession since 1999 during the Asian financial crisis. <laughs> Millions of Indonesians have been laid off or furloughed as the country struggled under the weight of the pandemic. And in April, the central bank revised down its growth outlook for this year to 4.1 to 5.1 percent from a previous estimate of 4.8 to 5.3 percent. Placing his bare hands into a swarm of thousands of bees, a Malaysian man uses his fingers to guide, gently guide them into a rattan basket. Oi Leng Chi is a member of a group that sa saves bees and their nests when they are discovered in cities, seeking to prevent the creatures from being destroyed by those who view them as pets. There's, there's a huge crisis in, in US and Europe where they are having a problem with bee going uh, almost extinct. I think it's, it's, it's uh, important that uh, we continue to, to preserve the bee and uh, make sure uh, that doesn't happen here. So, and the headmaster got stung twice. What? <laughs> 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 <laughs>